I've always been an admirer of the name Room to Read. Because the word room has uh, a, a good nuance. It means both a place and time. And in our system today, uh, well, lack of a space where children can simply read and not learn from what they're reading or to be accountable for what they've read, that kind of space has always been a bit squeezed. And time to read is, of course, very squeezed. Um, it, there's hardly a school in the country which has a period called the reading period. Occasionally, you establish it, and then it's hard to sustain it. So room to read has a very uh, a good uh, ground to be in India. It's now been around for uh, some 16 years. It's a young organization. Uh, actually, today, uh, it should celebrate its uh, great exuberant teenage uh, in which um, it finds itself in the middle of all kinds of cross currents, some discouraging, some encouraging. And I, I, I'm very happy that they decided to organize this particular conference, although I'm never too happy when a conference is organized only in Delhi. And I've been telling friends to please um, decentralize, have such conferences in all different regions of the country. Uh, the subject of children's literature poses a very peculiar kind of, um, um, should we say, problem for the system that we have in education in India. Um, it's because of various reasons. And I, this is not the kind of afternoon that I would like to spend on critiquing the system of education uh, for reminding all of us why uh, literature and especially children's literature has such a difficult time finding a sustainable space in our schools. Schools are our only hope in that sense that we go through schools in order to promote um, reading and children's literature and schools are not quite ready for it. Now that kind of sentence I hope has enough hope in it that one day they will be ready <laughs> and we won't have to persuade them and sometimes to join them in their struggle, um, handhold and so on and so forth. It's a very strange, awkward situation that uh, those of us who believe in literature, in uh, promotion of literacy or permanent literacy through um, uh, reading, uh, it's a very strange and awkward kind of feeling we have when we realize how hard our struggle has proved. Like this afternoon, when I was listening to others, I was trying to recall um, one of the early debates has been there in the 70s. Now, since mid-80s, there has been almost a consistent debate. Operation Blackboard was actually mostly about bringing children's literature to every school, and that's 19... 84, 85, before the current education uh, or the, the policy which is now about to go out, before it was formulated, this Operation Blackboard brought books to schools. And the project didn't prove sustainable. Uh, during the 90s, uh, several organizations uh, attempted quite hard, uh, and these included organizations like UNICEF, for example, and various um, civil society organizations, uh, they work very hard to create space for reading for pleasure in schools. Well, it didn't prove all that sustainable. How do we assess this period? I think if you are a, a tough kind of evaluator, you will say, an attempt was made. <laughs> but if you are a liberal, uh, lenient, uh, marker, you will say, a good attempt was made. <laughs> and uh, that's about uh, what you can say. And yes, it's never possible to make a, a generalized statement about our country, uh, simply because it's too big. Uh, no matter how wide angle a lens you use, you can never capture all of Indian reality in its more than one million schools with almost you know, 8 million or more teachers, and so on and so forth. So uh, I desist from making that kind of general observation. A state like Kerala, which established a children's literature institute, is obviously unique. 
and, and no other state has copied it, has managed to feel inspired by it, and so on. But that's true of Kerala in many different ways. In other states, there has been, of course, considerable, um, what you might call, progress. I think the question has always been of sustaining it uh, uh, when secretaries are moved out, uh, the new one doesn't always sustain the oldest program. Now, placed as education is between the bureaucracy uh, with its inspiration right from the 19th century onwards and um, the academia, um, action-oriented organizations like Room to Read and various others have a tough time of building these bridges, working on these sort of uh, uh, bridges themselves, crossing them over to this or that side and trying to bring people together around uh, otherwise very easy to accept uh, very good sort of positive goals. It's never been easy. So uh, this afternoon I don't want to offer you a kind of a mixed pickle. It, it, one can splurge on, on, on various aspects of this issue but I would like to focus attention on uh, to begin with, on the problem that we face constantly on a subject like this, of that of polarities. The moment you mention literacy, reading, early reading, uh, use of literature in education, you enter into polarities. Uh, this is not unusual uh, because there have been polarized debates on reading uh, right since early 20th century in nearly all major um, systems of the world, including US or Britain and so on and so forth. And this uh, old debate whether it's important to learn about language before you use language for reading has taken various forms. In our times, in the last 40, 50 years, I have seen the pendulum swing repeatedly from phonics to uh, meaningful reading, uh, as many times as you can remember in different countries and uh, we are no exception. Now the only thing we can say about ourselves is, well, we never moved away from phonics, so why getting back to it is such, such a strange feeling. Uh, schools, teachers actually uh, had remained fairly committed to the old traditional alphabet-based approaches to reading, which are not necessarily scaffolded by plenty of opportunities to read. Um, and this reality has not, has not changed much as far as the teacher's world is concerned. On the other hand, uh, there has been a monumental effort to bring out more books for children. Um, institutions like Children's Book Trust have done uh, you know, a, a great service to the nation. And today I gather from Mr. Banerjee that the MHRD doesn't want even CBT books to be there because it's not a government organization. That's a sad thing, but I hope India lives as much in the states as in the center. In fact, the center is no more the center. India has too many centers, lots of centers where we can feel a little more free and uh, do our own thing. But in any case, these polarities have, have been quite characteristic of our attempts to uh, bring in literature into the curriculum. You can get a flavor of these polarities by reminding ourselves the um, debates on what is reading, how do children learn to read. Uh, you will always have that debate between those who believe that children need to learn the elements of language first uh, before they can make sense of it. Now, no matter how many times you can prove that children are looking for meaning right from the birth, from their you know, early, early childhood onwards, um, those who want to give knowledge about language uh, don't feel disheartened. Then you have curriculum wars. Uh, curriculum wars uh, debates between people who feel that uh, the curriculum should offer subjects and subject knowledge uh, and those who feel that curriculum is a more holistic and more flexible kind of idea and therefore uh, it doesn't have to honor these walls between subjects right from early grades. But these uh, kinds of curriculum wars are 
proving very difficult for us to overcome. Also in the matter of division of grades or classes, these have prevailed. I can never forget a remark which uh, during my NCRT years I heard from uh, a, a state secretary level officer. After listening to a discussion more or less of the kind that we are having this morning, he said to me, uh, since I was serving the NCRT at that time, he said, Sir, will you allow a grade three textbook to be used in grade four? <laughs> and I said to the secretary, Sir, you obviously think that I have more power than you have. Uh, it's, a, it's a question that resonates so many difficulties of our system. Even if the topmost officer of a state thinks that this textbook will serve a purpose for many children, a, a year later, he feels skeptical or worried whether it will be allowed or not. That tells you how rigid the system is, uh, that it cannot freely allow teachers principals and others to use various kinds of text material as they think fit depending on uh, who they are, whose needs they are addressing. Now such a system of education obviously hurts many, many children. Uh, dropout rates have come down but children who are seriously hurt by education or get extinguished by even a few years of education are still probably in millions and for them Literature is really a healer. It, it's almost like you know, getting some fresh air in a, in a terribly suffocating environment, and therefore the importance of literature. But even on that matter, there is a polarity. And the polarity has to do with those who believe that literature ought to be written and used for a purpose. And typically in our country, that purpose is a moral purpose. We may not prevail upon all of our polit politicians and bureaucrats to become a little more moral, but surely we want all of our children to be absolutely perfect <laughs> as far as their personal morality is concerned. And so you have this debate between literature for enjoyment, literature for imagination, and literature with a purpose, and literature with a theme or with an agenda. And of course the education system itself is very, very polarized, uh, between schools that are attempting to promote critical thinking, uh, imagination and so on on the one hand, and schools that are actively indoctrinating children. And uh, these schools are not a few hundred, they are in tens of thousands today. All kinds of um, implications of this polarity in education um, can be seen in our economic, in our political, in our social and cultural life, and connections are not that difficult to make. You can have a look at these things yourself. Then, of course, evaluation. That's another big area of polarity. What should we assess? Outcomes or developmental progress? If a child has moved from point A to B, should we celebrate it? Or should we feel very critical that the child is not at point C? And so this polarity also dogs the system. Often it debunks education and the effort that various governments put in Sometimes it also affects the private sector, which otherwise should not feel so daunted by this culture of measuring everything by predicted or measurable outcomes. You know, you don't need a great philosopher like Dewey to remind you that whenever you measure something, you have to isolate it from the scene, from the rest. When you measure one aspect of a child's growth or development, you isolate the rest and then you lose out something or the other. Now, these are, of course, very sophisticated ideas. According to many officers serving various governments, they will say, no, no, we don't want this kind of woolly, general, sophisticated academic advice. You tell us what to do. And therefore, we have a great polarity between those who want to do today, and they might even quote Gandhi, say, do or die, and those who believe, let's think. <laughs> let's sit down and reflect on where we are before we do something. So this is another polarity. Now across all these polarities, bridges are very few, and I am very glad that um, institutions like Room to Read are um, attempting through this kind of conference to build a bridge in a highly polarized and charged kind of atmosphere in which it's very difficult to pull people together. Uh, even if the subject is uh, so, uh, you know, so hum human, so basic, so positive as um, children's literature. 
I want to spend a few minutes on uh, being a sort of a good book guide. Good book guide was the name of an organization which arose and fell apart after some time in England some years ago. It said, look, there is a big crowd of books. Let's guide our readers into some good books. They called it Good Book Guide. And it used to mention which books to read, which titles are worth reading this year, or um, which bookshops have them, and so on and so forth. Now, if you had a good book guide for children's literature today, uh, what kind of elements would you consider it should uh, note for guiding uh, publishers, authors, NGOs like um, Room to Read or um, Iktara uh, or Eklavya and so on? Can we talk about these elements in a generalized way? Of course, it's difficult. Uh, a better guide for what is good literature is always a study of books that have survived for a long time, classics from different countries. Uh, if we had workshops on a classic, a lot of elements will emerge from it, and we'll be able to absorb those elements more easily, uh, more easily than uh, we would if we were to kind of list those elements and say, these are the elements of good books, which of course are, you know, may sound even trivial. One can keep on repeating those elements all the time. We know them. Children's books ought to be attractive. They ought to be easy. They ought to be this, that. We can say a few things. But uh, it doesn't quite work that way. We need to look at uh, some important books that have survived over 100 years or more, uh, 50 years or more, to see what is it in that book which uh, even a otherwise cynical publisher uh, tolerates and keeps on bringing out new editions. Uh, sometimes, you know, not very well, but they do. I think of such books like in India, Mahagiri, Shankar's most, uh, most you can say, uh, winning title of Children's Book Trust, first published sometime in late 50s, continues to be reprinted, although with some minor changes which are not very warrantable. But Mahagiri is a great story of an elephant and its uh, determination to save a little kitten. In that process, Mahagiri herself, himself, gets a bit hurt. And I have met critics, I have met teachers, and people who say, sir, this kitab mein to bahut hinsa hai. Uh, because this poor elephant is goaded by somebody's knife, and so on. Now, this idea that a children's book should be completely politically correct is a terrible obstacle for writing of good children's books. And that's another good book guide kind of idea that you know, I'd like to flag this afternoon. That just as the Delhi Metro says, darwazon se hat kar khade ho. Similarly, we must say, political correctness se thoda dur rahe. Now, whether that political correctness has to do, it can be about anything. You know, today we are in the sphere of history where it's not possible to be spontaneous. It's not spontaneous. It's not possible to be yourself. You're kind of constantly reminded in how many ways you have to be politically correct. Uh, and that list is very long. Uh, if you are in the business of com setting up committees, <laughs> you have to follow so many criteria that you end up with very mediocre people. <laughs> Uh, because all the criteria can't be met with people who are available in, at, at a higher level. In children's books, the same problem persists. Uh, just far too many books are being written with a purpose. And it's not easy to write book with a Not everybody is an Astrid Lindgren who can write a book with some sort of uh, agenda in mind. I mean, Astrid Lindgren could pull off a book about death and make it just as child-centered as a book which involves, uh, you know, uh, being a strange child like Pippi Longstocking. It's one of the great classics of Swedish children's literature. But not, it's not every author's uh, game to be able to convey a message or write a book with a message and still make it an interesting book. So we end up producing a lot of books which are kind of overburdened or to begin with are malnourished in terms of uh, imagination or vocabulary and various other things simply because they are written with a purpose in mind. 
And therefore, uh, if it were possible to uh, discuss the importance of um, um, reading for the sake of reading, for the pleasure of reading, without, without necessarily uh, the goal of learning something from reading being met, I think children's literature would grow at a greater pace. Um, modern children's literature in many countries is facing very similar problems. So we are not alone in this, but we are late beginners. And therefore, for us, it's difficult to kind of accept that a book for children can be there without a message. Sometimes people amaze me by finding a message at a very deep level in a book. They say, you weren't aware of it, but it was there. And I'm very glad it was so deep that it took somebody's effort to kind of find it. Uh, we do need such sort of hidden books, <laughs> and not just e-books, <laughs> but H-books, where the message cannot be easily deciphered, uh, except by people who are determined to do so. And, and, and sometimes they are the people that you meet when you get into state level committees for selection of books. They ask not only for how many pages are permitted, but also whether it has a message, and then what message it has. That makes all the difference, because it has to be the politically correct message, and then it has to be currently politically correct message. And that's not easy for an author to kind of keep in mind when you're writing that book. I think the basic dictum for a good book simply is that it must have respect for children. It mustn't regard children as either inadequate or uh, lesser adults or foolish or lacking information and those kinds of ideas. If you don't have respect for children from the youngest age onwards, then you might as well get a license to run a petrol pump. Why waste time on writing for children? <laughs> if you don't have respect for children, why be a publisher of children's books? publish other things. I think this is a question that we have to kind of really focus on. What does it mean to respect children? Respect uh, their desire to learn. Uh, sometimes your desire to teach over, uh, creates an obstacle for children's desire to learn. We must get out of the way sometimes in order to let children make sense of uh, what we have written for them. And literature really is a very important space for that kind of interaction between adult and child. And there, if you are trying to nurture creativity, as many organizations are trying to do so, I think um, it's a very important matter to debate and discuss. What does it mean to respect a child's uh, being a child or child's curiosity, a child's um, way of learning. In our system, it's not easy to convey that, those kinds of issues, simply because our system isn't used to um, childhood as such. We must remember the broader history of this subject very briefly. That childhood is still a biological category in our country. It hasn't yet become a social category. We do have commissions now in every state for protection of children's rights, but um, the idea uh, of who is a child and how does, how does the social hierarchy, how does the uh, fact of there being so much poverty in the country, such malnourishment levels, how do they affect childhood? Can we generalize about it or must we then um, prepare our minds for having some idea of what it means to be a child, and then differentiate that idea in terms of socioeconomic classes, groups, regions, and so on and so forth. One has to be a sort of, one has to work on both levels together. Same is true of familiarity versus unfamiliarity debates. Many organizations continue to believe that nothing should be written or published which doesn't directly reflect the child's immediate context. Now, that way, a lot of writing, uh, good writing for children, will become meaningless or will become inaccessible. If, it, if a child had never seen an ocean, it doesn't mean that you don't write about the ocean. Uh, having a place where the child lives in mind is one thing, but dismissing all other places in the world is quite another. 
and a judicious mix of the familiar and the unfamiliar is something that children's authors have known in, throughout the history of children's literature in countries that have a longer history. We have a shorter history and that is where we feel uh, quite often guideless or uh, we feel daunted by the diversity of our country. And therefore, we feel that to address this diversity, we have to have very, very context-specific books. And when you talk about context, organizations, authors, publishers, they all get stuck with what does it mean? What does the word context mean? Does it mean that uh, children of the poor must have stories in books which reflect life of the poor only? And so on. Or um, does it mean geographical relevance? Does it mean... Um, um, uh, some sort of uh, preparedness for meeting the cultural conditions of that area. All of these are interesting themes, but none of them can be used, uh, I think, or warrants to be used for guiding authors or publishing for children. Uh, there has to be professional autonomy in that region if we want good children's literature to flourish. And uh, uh, there are always books available on which we can discuss in order to seek inspiration. What makes Vallikanan's Baski Sair, an NBT title, such a great classic? Ask ourselves, uh, discuss ourselves, read that book and see what makes it such an interesting book even if it's about a village somewhere in Tamil Nadu and the story is not a strong story at all. Um, Pat Hutchins, Goodnight Owl, what makes it a great story? Um, 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 uh, Mem Fox's story, um, uh, Hattie and the Fox. You can read it to a three-year-old, a five-year-old, or a 15-year-old, or a 60-year-old. You are always amused. And, and that is the beauty of any book for little children. If it creates that aesthetic amusement, then it's serving the purpose of humanizing us, humanizing our society. Uh, not by teaching us anything. There's absolutely no message in Hattie and the Fox. In fact, I mean, I, I, I've had a debate about whether uh, 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 Wanda uh, Gag's book, um, Millions of Cats, does it have a message? There are people who are determined to find one. But so far in the United States, they have failed and they have to kind of accept that this is a book that sells because it's a, it's, it's a great book and we don't understand it, what is its greatness. And that's the thing about uh, uh, good books for children, that when they survive, we don't exactly know why, why they do. And that sense of mystery should remain because that means children judge something that we don't fully understand and thank God we don't. If we did, <laughs> we will probably uh, try to replicate it or try to keep on sort of writing more and more and so on of that kind of stuff. Let me move on to the very important question of uh, building some sort of link between schools and uh, literature. This is not an easy link to form and I speak both from experience and from theoretical kind of concerns and reflection on this subject that our system poses impossible challenges for introduction of literature. Education itself is seriously compromised in India by various uh, kinds of pressures, such as pressure of the, the tuition and the coaching industry, which grabs the child right now, the, right from early age, and doesn't leave its grip till the child has gone to IIT, which a few people do, and the rest on, uh, think about it. <laughs> Uh, this grip is very problematic for any humanist and all of you, I assume, are humanists who want to introduce literature into such a system which is uh, struggling very hard uh, to give children uh, some space for, uh, for reflection, for simply enjoyment. This is, this is not going to be an easy goal. Efforts have been made to bridge that gap by holding workshops for teachers, workshops for parents, promoting books in schools, um, and so on. Room to Read is obviously among the uh, leaders of this uh, kind of effort. Popal's Eklavya, now Ektara, uh, publishing and making sure that books reach schools. 
Still the bridge remains difficult because schools have timetables. And I, I look for a school that has space for children's literature in its timetable. Inevitably it will fall in the library period. And the library pre period is like a, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, um, a space which everybody wants to grab. So if uh, mathematics needs some extra time, of course it will come from the library period and so on. So it's not safe. Literature is not safe in our schools. And, and that's not saying something new. Um, the National Council published a series of 40 early graded reading books in a series called Barkha. The idea was that this long enough series will melt some stony hearts to see that uh, children can not only learn reading on their own by reading a lot themselves, but also consolidate their habit of reading. And yes, the series worked very well in many states and uh, has proved sustainable over time. But it was just one of the many attempts which continue to uh, remain very isolated and inadequate considering the size of our system and its essential nature of being rather hostile to activities which are not examination oriented. And in one of these statements, I met a very good sort of uh, match. Somebody said, why don't you introduce an examination of literature and literary reading from early childhood? Meet oppression with oppression and so on. Well, we don't yet know exactly what you can do about this problem, that our examination-centric mind doesn't like things which cannot be easily examined. So we have banished more or less music from the curriculum it's um, something we treat as extracurricular. Uh, similarly, art mostly is extracurricular, and literature, of course, is. This is not an easy issue to resolve. But yes, I think persistent effort and persistent reflection on the kinds of problems we face are both necessary for us to find our way through this situation. I like to think that a great deal of uh, space can be recovered from the lost grounds called teacher training institutes. Few of us go there. Few, few of us think that it's worth going there because they are in another business. There are 16,000 institutes giving B.Ed., X thousand institutes giving D.Ed. and various other degrees. And uh, National Council of Teacher Education is an institution which is constantly battling with uh, inertia, corruption, inefficiency, and so on. This is a sector that we have to seriously look at. If we want to promote children's literature among teachers, then the training teacher really is a very important person to uh, keep in mind in what conditions that trainee learns pedagogic um, techniques, uh, in what conditions that teacher learns about education. These are all very uh, important questions for us to reflect on if we want to find uh, a good enough audience and market in that field. I use the word market uh, with a special affection for it. <laughs> Even though I have mostly worked for the government, uh, I feel uh, unless children's literature finds a market, its future will remain very limited. And by market, I do of course mean a market where uh, a lot of publishers are able to meet a lot of demand. That's where good magazines are born. That's where good literature is uh, published and reaches homes, not just schools. So while we focus on schools, we have to kind of keep in mind the long-term goal to bring reading into the orbit of a growing market in our society. Uh, only the market can sustain this movement and take it forward. Funding agencies will come and go. Governments will have interest today and no interest tomorrow. But if something becomes a part of the market of books uh, and uh, children's literature certainly deserves to become a market of, uh, uh, of books in India, then I think we can look at a sustainable future for this, uh, this uh, sector. Um, I have 
uh, spoken enough about the problem of building bridges, but I do want to have a little time uh, uh, before we end on the big challenge that we face all today uh, in the shape of the digital distraction. Um, this whole subject of what will happen to books in the digital age, I like to think that there will be a post-digital age. Everything has a post to it. Uh, modernity, when it was growing, thought, we thought it's here to stay, and it will never be called ancient history. But we are already in our lifetime witnessing post-modernity. And I bet we will witness post-digitality quite soon, sooner than we realize. What will post-digitality be like when digitality will be no more as exciting or exhilarating? It will be just another medium, another way of reading or another way of getting information. It will not replace the book. Now, there is considerable research now on the difference between the hard copy book and the digital book. Uh, Marianne Wolf's book, Reader Come Home, has an interesting kind of uh, explanation of why hard copy books are truly more important from the point of view of brain and neuroscience uh, compared to the digital book. It's a book I recommend to everyone. But the book has a split personality, like so many, us, so many of us who are surviving in this age. Uh, half of the book is about this theoretical subject. Comparison of reading from hard copy books with reading from digital material. And Marianne Wolf, who is a neuroscientist researcher, she is squarely uh, with the hard copy book, as if you go by the first half of her book. In the second half of her book, she develops that very special thing which a lot of people from the so-called developed world feel when they look at the rest. And what that feeling is, a sense of pity <laughs> or a sense of kind of guilt. She says there are children in Ethiopia and there are children in um, uh, Kenya and elsewhere who have no access to books. And therefore, uh, why should we prevent them from having digital books? as if digital books will be easier to provide on, in large numbers in Ethiopia, and some people think in Chhattisgarh, and so on and so forth. I think this whole argument needs to be revisited to see, uh, can we distinguish early childhood and childhood from later childhood and adolescence from the point of view of um, medium? At what point does a digital book makes sense, or digital material makes sense. Now on that, uh, the debate is still quite inadequate in our country. In, a, in fact, on the question of uh, the child's development itself, uh, we need to renew some of the older debates of the 1940s and 50s. And today we have begun to look at children as a kind of a uh, unnuanced, flat sort of category, which is very problematic. Uh, if you are uh, in the business of education. We should be able to have a slightly more nuanced approach to this subject, and we must therefore hold judgment, learn from the Supreme Court that you can hold judgment for a very long time. So on some matters, you can hold it for 100 years. Uh, why can't we hold our judgment for a few years or maybe a few decades on this subject? and not get blown over by the digital um, um, hurricane. I think it's very important for us to sit down with our officers who are you know, determined to develop India very, very rapidly, and therefore think that the faster the means, the faster will be our children's growth. Now, that's not the way children grow up. And I think we do need to uh, remind those who run the country uh, that this is not the way this area works. Childhood takes time, and the 16 or 18 years of childhood do need to be seen in a nuanced way. Thank you for providing this opportunity.